Hey, this is Sarah Marie, and you are listening to Time in the Studio, where we offer support for multi-passionate, earth-loving creatives who want to dig in and flourish. I'm a multimedia artist, clinical herbalist, and doula based in Boulder, Colorado, and so excited to share with you episode 73. Back by popular demand, I got to have a chat with Davina Simmons of Rooted Birth Doula Services. Davina is a full spectrum doula dealing with birth, postpartum, death, and just all encompassing range of experiences, basically holding space for uh, transformation for people. Uh, She's also a childbirth and lactation educator, a facilitator, a writer, and a photographer. And in this conversation, we got to chat about how rest can be medicine and what it's like being a full spectrum doula during this pandemic. Her doula practice has evolved a lot over the last two years. We talk a little bit about that. We discuss rage and grief and ancestral healing and the range of emotions that occur during the postpartum time, especially. She created a worksheet for her clients to help have difficult conversations, ideally before a baby is born. And we discuss several workshops she has hosted and also plans to host in the future, the connection with the Enneagram and racism, and get into some writing practices and rituals to help release energetic cords between oneself and others. Uh, We also talk about dancing through grief and witnessing birth stories as a way to help bring more healing to this planet. And also just talking about mothers and losing our mothers and yeah, giving birth and losing people. So birth and death and how those things are so intertwined. Oh, another cool thing. She was recently featured on NPR and it is such a great episode. It's only about seven minutes and it's a great listen, really beautiful. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes but you can find it on her um, website too. And you can listen back to our previous episode, episode 30. That was from almost two years ago now. Okay. Before we hop to it, I have a major favor to ask. If you like this show and you enjoy this episode, please share it with a friend. Big thanks for your support, for listening, and for doing what you do. Okay, let's jump in. Cha-cha-cha. Well, I would love to, I'd love to get into how your work has shifted. I think it's been, it's been over a year since we talked. Yeah, I I think more than two. So the year after you and I talked, that was a really big year for me with my practice. It, It grew and expanded and really took off. And I started teaching workshops to folks in the wellness community around like centering, it was called Centering the Marginalized Experience. And that workshop was really about getting getting down into the into the depths of what it means to make your practice inclusive and mm. what type of personal work that really involves and so a lot of people come to the class with their notepads and they're like oh my gosh you're going to tell me how to do this right blah, blah blah and then they get into the class and before they know it I'm like let's talk about shadow work like let's talk about the witch wound let's talk about what it means to really do your own work before you try to even embody what it means to take care of other people. And that workshop came to me, it it came to me through a series of people and then through encouragement. And then so I got to do that four or five times in person. And then once during the pandemic, and it was pretty, it was really powerful. Like, and what it really showed me is I love teaching, like teaching is really special to me. And it allowed me to do something that was outside of doula work, which was like swallowing me. Mm. (laughs) So and in a good way, like I think Mm -hmm. I just thought I got really lost in, in birth and postpartum work. And it was a really beautiful. That was a beautiful year, a lot of a lot of babies born and a lot of people taken care of in that time. And, you know, 2020 was a year was was a year also full of births, even through the pandemic, which required a lot of shifting and pivoting as a birth worker who is immunocompromised, who is in a black body, 
and what it means mm-hmm. to take that risk and still be supporting people. And it's not romantic. It's not, you know, ponies and rainbows. Like it's, re- it was really hard, really scary. And, and it required a lot of flexibility because, you know, we didn't know a lot at the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic hit and we didn't know where we were going. We had no idea. And so to be ushering people through the journey and onto the bridge of parenthood when they have no idea what they don't know. And then I know a little bit of that, but I also have no idea what's happening with this pandemic. There was a lot of communication, a lot of communication, a lot of planning and preparing for me to not be present with them or me to be present with them. And yeah, so there a lot a lot of energy was expended in 2020 and I also did postpartum work in 2020 and that was you know just in its own right taking care of people who are even more isolated from their communities than they ever have been with a brand new baby and it was heartbreaking it was really special but it was heartbreaking to witness and to see people navigating this alone and to be the only person that they see, you know, like when I come in, they're just like, you're here. <laughs> Here's yeah. my baby, but like, please talk to me. And yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And like I said, I think postpartum work is truly the deep end of birth work. Mm-hmm. I, I don't say that to make birth sound like it's light and it's easy because it's not like being a birth doula is really, really hard work. But the postpartum space is where people start licking their wounds. Mm, They're licking their wounds, like licking their wounds of life like that, you know, this baby has now shown them that they have because the baby is triggering them is bringing up things. The baby is the mirror of the postpartum and the baby will show you what work you have not resolved. And so, yeah, yeah. And so people are licking their wounds from that. People are processing this big experience of whatever it took to get that baby here. Like they're figuring out what their birth means to them. And sometimes even in that haze, trying to figure it out when I'm like, we can, we can touch that in time. But right now, like you are so sleep deprived, you are likely dehydrated, you're likely undernourished, you're likely feeling very far away from your partner. If you have a partner, you're likely feeling very far away from your community. So like, first things first, like, have you showered today? Yeah, like, get like, you a glass of water. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> and like, look at your nipples. They are jumped up to the high heavens. Like, let's take patience. So Just there were so many, I think, you know, there were so many things to to navigate with people as I supported them postpartum. And, you know, I think that that was a big experience. So that is, you know, where I've been since we've spoken last. I've I've Mm. learned so much, so much as a doula from 2020 and also just from, you know, doing this work and going to birth that's different every time and supporting a postpartum family that has different needs every time. And within that, the learning continues. Like you just, you know, you finish your training and you think, oh, like I'm going to, I'm going to go and do this. And like 80 births later, I'm like, oh, (laughs) I'm still learning things. I'm still being humbled. I can see how you're such a natural teacher though. And I love that Mm -hmm. you have started offering classes to be able to share this wisdom because you've done so many trainings, you've been there for so many births, you like, Mm -hmm. you just have this rich experience and understanding. And, and even before you got into the birth work, I know you were doing a lot of work with counseling and also Mm -hmm. photography. So there's like this beautiful merging of the arts and just a deep poetic understanding of people and where they're at and Mm -hmm. being able to meet Mm -hmm. them there and yeah I don't where is my question going but (laughs) I think I actually might be catching where your question I think that the all-encompassing reflection that I have from all of what you've said is that I really have enjoyed walking with people in their grief Mm. like I have been so honored and so captivated by what grief means to us Mm. in, in its many forms and iterations of its existence. And I think my relationship with grief in particular has really helped me 
to stand with people in theirs because like grief can take on so many different formations in our lives and like it can be the tornado one day and like the like slow going river the next day and it Mm -hmm. feels so minute to minute and I think that we often are not prepared or we weren't prepared before a pandemic to really sit with our grief and like acknowledge it and understand it and ask it questions and like take it to tea. And so I think that that has been truthfully in everything that I've done and working with wellness practitioners and helping them unravel their shit and working with postpartum families and working with birthing families. Like I have really been able to touch people's grief with them and Mm -hmm. not by any of my doing, like it is simply that they are open and simply that they trust me and to witness people in that space like to witness people actively participating with their grief has been quite the experience I just want to sob like just (laughs) that idea I can feel how you are with people in this deeper way and I saw on your website there was somebody commented they were like I just Davina would show up and say what would feel good Mm. and I just I love that that just feels so grounding I could feel how that would just be so grounding for you working with the birthing person and for the -hmm. family just to kind of like be able to like reflect like what do I need Mm -hmm. what would feel good Mm -hmm. and where am I at emotionally? I love that you're able to really be with people and do that shadow work and kind of Mm -hmm. reflect on that to come out the other side of it, because I think it's really easy to just get stuck in the muck and not, or to try to avoid it. But I love that you're able to just like deepen into it with people so that they can Mm -hmm. evolve and learn a new way of being. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I think we, as a society, at least as an American society, we do not have an understanding of what it means to be in relationship with grief. And I think when people meet their grief for the first time, it can feel very disembodying. It can feel chaotic. It can feel like a threat. And, you know, I... I think that we also, as at least as adults, have experienced grief throughout our childhood, but we don't have a name for it Mm -hmm. until people like our partners, our romantic partners, or our close intimate friendships and relationships, or our newborn babies ring the bell and Mm. like really help us understand the sides of us that we have neatly tried to pack away and dissociate from. And I I really do. I was just talking to a friend the other day and we were talking about this anger that he had. And mm-hmm. I said, is it anger that you have or is it grief? And he was like, whoa. He was like, my body just said it was grief. Like when you asked yeah. me, when you said the word and I was like, we don't, we don't spend enough time understanding that like so much of what is behind anger and sadness and fear and guilt and all of those things are versions of grief that are just asking to be witnessed and are asking for space and asking for a collective breath or a moment, a moment. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'm, I'm just so fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by how grief locates itself in our bodies. I'm fascinated by how grief, you know, is, is a vehicle, how grief and rage are friends Mm. and partner together. And I tell people in my workshop, when I open and introduce myself, I always share like this workshop was born out of my rage as a black woman. Like Mm. this workshop was born from rage that needed a vehicle and needed a place to live and to be because my body could not hold that. My spirit could not hold that. And so what you are sitting in this container that you are sitting in, like that's where this came from. And I think if we're able to give those 
experiences and those emotions and those relations with our with with grief and with rage when we can do that like we can change the world Mm -hmm. like we can change the world we can touch people in places that emotionally that they've never been touched or experienced or witnessed in and because we all know it we know those collective feelings like we know them but for some of us we just have never given ourselves permission to give it a name wow Oh my yeah. God, that's, I love that you were able to create that container that evolved from your rage, but then be able to like give it momentum that helped heal yourself and everyone in the group and help them to step forward to serve mm-hmm. marginalized bodies with a deeper awareness. Is there, yeah. are there, is there anything like an exercise or something you can offer as a way for people to kind of dip into processing their own shit to Mm -hmm. do a better job. Yeah. You know, I think the first thing I would say, and I know that this isn't necessarily accessible to everyone, but therapy, (laughs) like I, I think that first and foremost, sitting with a licensed care provider who embodies some part of your own like existence and known existence is important. I think that being able to have someone witness and walk with you, just like a doula would, right? But like Mm -hmm. someone who is trained to witness you and also help you keep yourself safe is the first step. I think the second step is sitting with yourself long enough to feel uncomfortable. Mm. I think that we try to navigate away from our own discomfort by buying things, by filling our houses with things, by eating, by drinking, by recreational drugs, like not to say that recreational drugs aren't fun, but like by (laughs) distracting ourselves with those things. And when really like what we're trying to, what we're doing is running. And so I think sometimes sitting with with things until they start to feel uncomfortable and like letting those things be activated. And I learned this one technique um, in a, it was a group that I was a part of led by this woman. Her name is Bernadette. I think her last name is Pleasant. I think her name is Bernadette Pleasant. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Great name. Right? Powerful. (laughs) And, And Bernadette is a powerful person. And I was able to participate in this beautiful group right actually around the time that George Floyd was killed And the group was put on by Sabia Wade, who runs the birthing advocacy doula trainings. And and Sabia is an incredible human, but she put this group together and we did a grief dance and we listened to someone drum and we did it on zoom. And this person was drumming live and we, she led us through this dance, like where it was just moving your body wherever you were and then screaming Mm. So like just starting to make sounds and starting to just scream and starting to like let kind of activating your vagus nerve um, and really like giving your vagus nerve an opportunity to kind of like come back online. And then as you started to feel your grief come to you, Bernadette instructed us to put our hands on our chest and our heart space and ask the grief how much time it needed. And I remember saying how much time do you need and like I just felt like I felt like my bones wanted to just fall out of my skin and like just be on the floor for a while you know like it was just this really powerful moment of literally turning towards myself and giving myself the attention that I needed and really truthfully and I know people hear this but like what it means to reparent yourself like turning to my inner child and being like babe Mm. (laughs) like what do you need in this space right now because like it's okay Mm. to come out and say what you need I know it might not have been okay when you were a kid but like it's okay now so I think that that tool was like has been really helpful in moments where I just you know big feelings because adults Mm -hmm. feel big feelings too but like we just we shut down like little kids are like, I'm going to have a fucking tantrum (laughs) right here, right now in front of the Cheetos Mm -hmm. on aisle number six. Like we're going to pull this shit apart. But adults are like, well, I'm just going to pack this away and have five martinis later. And so just really (laughs) giving 
giving ourselves permission to access that mm. and feel it. So beautiful. Thank you for that. I just feel yeah. like that's such a beautiful tool. And I, mm. I can feel how that's going to help people. Maybe me, I need to do like a mm. rage dance, just like turn the lights off, turn the music up yeah. loud and just like, yeah. Yeah, just mm-hmm. dance and mm-hmm. scream. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think more often than not, that has helped me so much in birth spaces when yeah. a birth is like happening and I'm like, I am exhausted. I have nothing left to give this family. I need to call my backup. But in the meantime, like what's happening in me right now that is like, taking me away from these people that I care about that I'm supporting. And it's really given me some opportunities to like reground and refocus myself. Like, and I literally do it on the toilet. I will step Mm -hmm. out of that birth and go to the bathroom and just sit Mm -hmm. on the toilet for a moment and just ask like, what do Mm -hmm. you need? Like, what do you need? How much time do you need? Cause like, I got shit to do out there. Like there's a baby trying to navigate their way through someone's pelvis. Like I gotta go. (laughs) But like, I wanted, I wanted to sit with this because whatever it is, is asking for something too in my body. And, you know, I I just find that those parts of ourselves come out when we're deeply tired, when we're so Mm. tired and, Mm. you know, we're like weary and then something wants to like pop up and be like, hi. (laughs) Now you're going to have a crying fit too. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah. Yeah. Lots of wisdom there that I'm grateful to have been given about it yeah that's incredible I love how do you structure those classes like I'm curious like Mm -hmm. I want to take that class are you going (laughs) to offer it again because that sounds yeah I I am I think you know doing it for the first time online in the pandemic like what really was missing and I will say this because it, it I felt it I did the the original workshop in an apothecary that was owned by a dear friend of mine that has now closed because of the pandemic. But the apothecary space was truly magical. Like, I mean, like water, earth, wind, fire elements everywhere, Uh. like community altars in the space, like oils and like just it was like the space that facilitated such important self introspection and so but but what what this workshop does have now that we didn't have before was people are able to do this work in the containers of their own homes Mm -hmm. and I think that that still gives me something to work with and gives them something to work with because it feels safe. And so the way that the workshop is structured is it's structured in six modules in person. When we were doing it in person, it was one day and it was from 10 AM to like 4 PM one day. Oh, nice. And I was like cramming it in oh one, <laughs> one day. And so when we, ha- when I did it online with the pandemic, I had it start on a Friday night for three hours. And then we went all day Saturday And the first module, we kind of introduce a lot of concepts around like what we're going to be talking about, some vocabulary, giving people a little bit more, giving people words, giving people language to understand where we're going. And I think that the second module, we talk about intergenerational trauma and epigenetic tags and like explaining Mm -hmm. how someone in a marginalized body, but really anybody carries intergenerational trauma with them and carries, you know, like the epigenetic tags that host and make space for intergenerational trauma to continue. So we talk about that. I think module three really focused on shadow work and understanding our own biases and understanding how to do shadow work, where to start, where to go, and how shadow work never finishes. So like, we're really unpacking the concept of it and kind of the benefits of doing shadow work, because I think a lot of people assume it's just this mucky, hard, deep stuff, but really helping people find, understand how you find liberation when you do shadow work. And then, and I think that also helps people understand how they perpetuate problematic behavior, how they perpetuate harm in communities that have already been harmed, communities that are, that have been marginalized. And so really helping people dig in and like touch their own roots. And there's a lot of dialogue. So I really have them talk to each other. Most people that sign up for this course are white women. That's Mm -hmm. just kind of the, you know, which I think that truthfully are 
are definitely, I feel like white women are definitely the, the target group for this workshop because white women understand what it means to be oppressed, but also what it means to have power. Mm. And white women are usually also the ones who are co-opting wellness spaces and doing mm. a lot of wellness work. And so that is usually the, the group that I have in front of me. And every now and then I get someone who is a part of the Black, Indigenous, or People of Color community. And I offer scholarships for them to take the course, but also with the understanding that like, hey, this is who's going to be in this workshop. And I just want you to know that to make sure that people still feel safe and like to help facilitate what that means to keep people safe. So then the other modules after that are talking about why marginalized communities don't receive appropriate care. So like, what are the barriers? Because I think a lot of people assume that it's just because they don't have access to it or they don't have money. And really, it's like, no, actually, like the people in the systems are the problem. So like, let's really get into that. Um, So we really get, we comb through like every piece of what that means. And then the last couple of modules are really about like, okay, where do you go from here? But we spend a lot of time also talking about teachers. Like we talk a lot about Mm. what it means to hold teachers accountable, what it Mm. means to have, have, what's the word I'm looking for? So it's the D, discernment, having discernment Mm -hmm. around who you're learning from Mm -hmm. and also challenging challenging teachers and instructors when you see them being problematic when you see them perpetuating harm and you know causing harm in in communities and what it means to um, be of integrity so we talk a lot about that and we um, really dig in there and then the last thing is really kind of a a professional audit so we do a professional audit where I kind of help people I give them a lot of steps of like here's how to comb through your own practice and look for Mm -hmm some of the like red flags and to really figure out how to know an integrity when you will need to serve someone and know an integrity when you should not serve someone. Like when Mm. you're someone comes to you and you're like, I am not the right person to help you because there is someone else in the community who embodies your lived experience that can take better care of you than I can. And like what it means to wrestle with yourself and know when that is appropriate. So a lot of kind of accountability and and calling out and calling in in this workshop, which it's a good time. Like it's a really good, yeah. (laughs) It sounds amazing and such a gift. And I feel like so necessary right now, you know, and I, and just, Mm -hmm. yeah, potent and perfectly timed because I feel like people are just really waking up to, yeah just work that we need to do around Mm -hmm. marginalized Mm -hmm. bodies, racism, Mm -hmm. sexism, ableism, you know, all the isms and just like, okay, let's do this work. Like let's jump in and do it. So I feel like it's time is right. For sure. Like the isms and the phobias. Right. And also I think that sometimes people really want to jump in and, and do something and, point a finger at the problem and they don't want to point to what the problem is internally and that is like I think that's the biggest problem because like when you can't understand the roots of your own shit like how on earth are you going to be safe for other people like how on earth are you going to have the internal and external awareness and and integrity to receive feedback to receive you know when people have feedback for you what it means for you to receive that and hold it and do something with it because I think that the problem a lot of what the problem is is we have these communities of usually white folks or able-bodied folks or cis folks who point their fingers at the issue and Mm -hmm. don't realize that like pointing your finger is also a problem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you have to call in your people. You have to call in your people. So Mm. it's really, I really try to, to, you know, work within that space with who is in those workshops and talk about the, the issues there and kind of the common patterns, but also to help people look back to their lineage. So that workshop is also talks, we talk a lot about ancestral work and I was, privileged to work with the wonderful amazing Rachel Weitz who I know you know oh and yes so doing that work really helped me like really reconstruct and liberate myself from problematic patterns in my own lineage and my own family and so 
we do a lot of, we talk a lot about ancestral work in this workshop and, and talk a lot about really looking back at your lineage and putting your finger on certain things that you mm. still embody today mm-hmm. that are still embodied in your family and like why we have to start. I tell them all the time, like you have to, before you can do, you have to be like before mm. you can do any of these things, before you can do these things and make change, you have to embody it. You have to live yeah. it because it's, there will, there's an issue if it's, if you're not embodying yeah. it, there's, there's a problem there and it's hard work and it's lifelong work. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. But I love that you're doing it. You're making it available and bringing that to the light. Has it been challenging to be kind of like, to teach that? You know, after every class, I'm pretty wiped out. And it, it's more of just holding a container and holding space. But I also think, you know, one of the things that I say to them in my introduction, as I'm introducing myself, is that there will be things that I say to you today that make you feel angry or uncomfortable, because it's coming from the mouth of a black woman. And you have to sit with that. But I, in, I think that like, I feel really privileged to be able to be in to finally be the one teaching this because I think while I think that this work is for white people to teach each other I don't think that a lot of white people are there yet and I also am grateful that like this is this is finally work that I want to do because I'm being paid to do it I'm Mm -hmm. not just pulling from my own personal reserves of energy and bandwidth and talking to the white people in my life that I love because I don't do that shit anymore. <laughs> I told yeah. in 2020, yeah. in summer of 2020, I told the white people who were left in my life, um, <laughs> like this is these are the rules of the game, and mm-hmm. if you don't want to play it, you gotta go. And yeah. but I started pink slipping. I call it pink slipping. I was pink slipping white people in my life for years before that. But I finally now with this workshop, like this is a group that I I feel like I can talk to. And mm-hmm. also am, am being compensated for my time and compensated yeah. for all of the work it took to pull it together. And so it is hard, not in the, not in that way of being a black woman talking to white people, because the white people who show up to this class are ready to do the work. Like right. them signing up and showing up is, is a huge part of why it goes so well. But I think that, you know, just teaching this and speaking to people and holding people in this you know like together yeah it's big it's big it is really big it is really (laughs) big and I could I just could see how I think I don't know what your Enneagram is I'm like an I'm a nine so I hate Mm -hmm. conflict (laughs) so the idea of like kind of getting in front of people and Mm -hmm. telling them that they have work to do yeah (laughs) <laughs> thing I could ever possibly do like that and just... that is such a nine characteristic which I my partner is a nine and I'm an eight so oh. that is like we are, my partner and I are the challenger and the pe- what is the nine the is nine the is the peacemaker yeah peacemaker. so mm-hmm. can you imagine what it's like in our house? we've, <laughs> grown, we've, we've uh-huh. grown to understand and and understand what it means to be an eight and a nine in a loving relationship but there are days where I'm sure he wants to put me in a box and shit me off somewhere (laughs) but I'll say like I think that you know sitting in front of people and and telling them they have work to do and hearing that like that is also a symptom of of whiteness right like it's a Mm. symptom of of freezing as a white person when truth is being spoken Mm. and freezing Mm. because you know your, your felt sense, your felt embodied sense of truth is that it's true, right, in your bones. Mm-hmm. But when white people have been subjected to violence for centuries and centuries and centuries, violence against themselves, violence against women, violence against people of color, violence against indigenous communities, like you freeze because you are stuck in the tension of knowing what is right, but witnessing what is not. Mm-hmm. And white people don't often know which way to go in that and Mm -hmm. have been complicit for so long that it does create like ancestrally that is a symptom of whiteness and so it is like to sit in front of people and be like y'all have work to do what like white supremacy is perfectionism there's no such thing as work to do (laughs) so wow that is (laughs) that's blowing my mind I mean I (laughs) 
<laughs> that's just so, I can just see how that's so true. And that's, yeah. This? Let me think. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I just, I love how you're able to just be that mirror for people. And I also love talking earlier about like the postpartum phase and how that yeah. is a time when birthing people are kind of their babies are a mirror mm-hmm. for things. And yeah. have you found any, anything that helps mamas or families to kind of move through that time, like mm-hmm. any mm-hmm. tools because I try to just be there, but I don't, I'm like, I want to have more tools in the toolbox. And yeah. So I don't know if there's like, if there's anything you can suggest. Yeah, I can. So yeah, the tools, like things that I find, things that I find that help postpartum folks navigating the first three months, which I call the fog, because I think the Mm. first three months are, you're recovering, your body is recovering. I mean, your body recovers from birth for, it takes a year for your body to recover from birth or more. I think people Mm -hmm. fool themselves when they say like, I'm going to be out up and out in a month or two weeks. I'm like, that's crazy. But yeah, like you just evicted a human from your body. Yeah. And so anyway, I think I have a lot of real talk with my clients in the prenatal space, we do a lot of postpartum education and preparation and planning in the prenatal space where I give clients a handout. It's eight pages long. Whoa. And it has all of the sections of life that you will rub up against in the postpartum time. So we're talking about feeding your baby. We're talking about nourishing yourself. We're talking about sleep. We're talking like all these things. And I ask them questions, situational questions, like, what are you going to do if this happens? What will you do if this happens? Who will you call if this happens? What do you plan to do to navigate this together? How do you, because I believe that no person, partner or birthing person, exits the postpartum time unscathed. Like, Mm -hmm. it gets everybody. I don't care Mm -hmm. how much money you have. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you... Um, have your whole community around you Mm. I don't care if you're I don't care I don't care because (laughs) I've seen it time and time again I don't care I'm like (laughs) if I tell my clients expect speed bump Mm. expect road closures expect road blocks like Mm -hmm. your journey in the postpartum time is not going to be a straight line just like your birth is not going to be a straight line and we, I think when people see this, this handout and I tell them, you don't have to complete it. You don't have to have answers. I want you to read through it together. And I want you to discuss like, this is for dialogue. Wow. If there's someone who doesn't have a partner, then we'll go through it together and talk through it to help prepare. But I also say, nice. who is your closest support person? Like, who would that person be? Because that's going to be the person you go through this document with. And I'll tell you, I would, I would say maybe like 45 to 50% of my clients actually like spend time with it before mm-hmm. we have that, that meeting prenatally. Mm-hmm. And the other half, we go through it together in our visit and they're like, Oh shit. Like they're like, scratching <laughs> and I, but I think it's really important for people to realize that because I, as Americans, we think this all the time. I tell my clients, you are not the exception. Like, what makes you think you are so special that this is going to be easy for you? Because it's not. And as we know, rearing children and raising children was not a two-person job, like, centuries ago. Like, our ancestors did this together. Like, they Mm -hmm. did this in community. There were, like, 10 or 11 people rolling deep to help you take care of you, your baby, and your partner, or Mm -hmm. your sperm donor, however we want to say that. (laughs) And we talk a lot about it. And then when they get into postpartum, when they find themselves in a postpartum body with a new baby, I, I relentlessly check in, like, especially, especially like with COVID, but like even before that, Mm -hmm. because like birds on Brooklyn, I love them. I love, 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 love Erica and Laura. So, 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 so. But one of the things that they talk about is what happens to postpartum people, they get dropped at the curb. Mm-hmm. And how you have your baby and everybody's like, congratulations. Oh my God, you're amazing. Congratulations, your new baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you don't hear from people and mm-hmm. people stop coming by and 
you're like sleepy and you hate your partner and sometimes you resent your baby and sometimes you resent your body because for some people their bodies failed them that's what they believe is that their bodies failed them in birth and you need people to come around you and say it is okay to resent your baby today Mm -hmm. it is okay to be having a hard time with your body because your body didn't do what you thought it was supposed to do and Mm -hmm. reframing what failure is because nobody's body will fail them like Mm -hmm. people and systems and care providers will fail you your body Mm -hmm. did not fail you but like Mm -hmm. really everybody in the postpartum time needs people to reframe things for them because (laughs) we they don't have the ears to hear what is actually true and they are sleep deprived probably Mm -hmm. dehydrated probably undernourished like I was saying earlier Mm -hmm. probably stinky haven't had a shower (laughs) covered in baby shit and like baby piss and baby bark (laughs) who can hear anything when you are stinky sticky and stupid tired like who (laughs) who can hear it right and so and so we need we need the threads of our community to hold us together Mm. and that is like that is our job is to show up for people and weave our threads into people's stories and then the next support person comes in and weaves their thread into the story and you come back and weave your thread like Mm -hmm. we are supposed to be holding this tapestry together and instead we have people who are isolated who are not getting enough sleep who are not being fed nutritious foods who are struggling to feed their babies from their bodies or struggling to make the choice to to prioritize their mental health and not feed their babies from their bodies because that's okay too. Like mm-hmm. people are not showing up and people are not giving postpartum people permission to be a mess, to fall apart and to hate it because it is mm-hmm. hateable. It's hateable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolute fuck shit. It's is what <laughs> and, and, and what, what a gift to be able to tell someone you are going to love your baby so much, but you are going to be in it. Like you are Mm going to be in some really intense shit and you're going to be holding the dualities of joy and pain and resentment and regret and gratitude and life changing love. Like you're going to be holding that bag and you're going to be digging in that bag every day and pulling one of those things out every other minute. Like Mm -hmm. why why are we not preparing people for this more is mm-hmm. my question. And also when people get to the other side and then they get through it, why are they not talking about it? Why are mm-hmm. they not like giving people the opportunity to witness their own experience and what they went through? Because there's healing in that too. Right. I'm curious, like what, what could that look like for birthing people to tell their stories more? Like, yeah. 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 So I'm actually, this is actually something I'm, I'm introducing soon called birth story witnessing. I'm also going to be offering a postpartum witnessing for, for people, but birth story. Yeah. Birth story witnessing is very similar to birth story medicine, which is something that a woman named Pam England, who is affiliated with birthing from within does some training on. I haven't taken the training. And Mm -hmm. so I interviewed a lot of women in my family to understand what birth story witnessing means to for those in my family that are elders now. And so birth story witnessing for me, what that offering will look like is um, an hour of witnessing you as you share your birth story. For some people, this is like the first time they've shared it. For some people, it's the 50th time, like any time in the postpartum space, which is basically from the time you have your baby to the time you die. That's mm-hmm. postpartum, right? So witnessing them in that and then spending the next hour helping them write their birth story. And so talking mm-hmm. to them about what it means for you to write your birth story and find a new sort, a new sense of sovereignty in that. And help, and I, and I am not a trained therapist. So like birth story witnessing is not to help you process the traumatic things about your birth. It's to have someone listen to you in that. And obviously, like, I have a counseling background. And so knowing when it's appropriate to make a referral or make sure that someone is connected to a therapist, but Mm -hmm. helping people speak their stories, because I think that one of the things that we oftentimes experience is a life changing event like birth. Mm -hmm. We are not 
witnessing people enough. We're not right. hearing their stories enough. And so this is to witness people who have had empowering births, because I think people who have empowering, beautiful births that they're really happy about also don't get to, to talk about them because we are so full of the traumatic birth stories and the birth stories where things went terribly wrong or where things went wrong and didn't go the way we wanted them to, that oftentimes people who have really empowering birth stories don't get the same space or acknowledgement that they should either. And so this is birth story witnessing is for anyone who has had a baby with any type of outcome. So that is a live birth, a baby who was born alive, that is a baby who was born dead. That is someone who had a spontaneous abortion, which is also a term for miscarriage that I use is spontaneous mm-hmm. abortion. Someone who chose to have an abortion, someone who had to terminate a twin in their pregnancy. So it is for anyone who has been pregnant and has had a baby exit their womb or their belly with any outcome. And I think that mm-hmm. this is important because Like, these are the experiences that shape us. Yeah. These are the experiences that people, like, I wish that I could hear my, like, grandmother's birth story, my great grandmother's birth story. I, you know, like, I wish that I could, I wish that I could hear the baby, uh, the story of, you know, the babies that are not here in my family that were born, but were born dead or were Mm. born, but they were lost. They were, they had a spontaneous abortion and were lost, right? So, Birth story witnessing is something that I'm rolling out for people. And then postpartum witnessing is the second thing of really, this is for people who have been right postpartum at any point in their life, which is forever, but helping people not only reconcile, and I can't help people reconcile their postpartum experience. I'm going to say that that's not my responsibility, but Mm -hmm. helping people sit with it and offering them a moment to be witnessed and offering them a moment to forgive themselves. Because Mm -hmm. I also think that people move through the postpartum time wishing they had prepared more, feeling abandoned, feeling alone, feeling let down, feeling like they failed at the beginnings of parenting because there were things they didn't know. People having remorse and regret about deciding not to body feed their babies or deciding Mm. to stop body feeding their babies. So just an opportunity to to witness people, you know, say, I see you to say your experience is valid and to connect them to the resources that they might need that they don't even know that they need, or to help them offer, to offer them some type of ancestral medicine, right? Like, because, right, being able Mm -hmm. to to be witnessed is, it it is ancestral medicine, it is an opportunity to not pass down some type of something to the next generation in your family, which is your living children. So, yeah. That's such a beautiful gift. And I could see how it's going to be so wonderful for those babies to have that too, you know, to have that, the story of their birth, I think to have that recorded or documented Mm -hmm. in some way and for birthing people to be able to reflect and maybe rewrite their story idea. Yeah. I'm really hoping that it, I think the biggest intention behind it is to continue to honor birth sovereignty and to continue to really to normalize birth Mm -hmm. and to help people continue to understand the, like how profound witnessing really is, how healing, how healing witnessing is, how redemptive witnessing is. Like, I think this is a space where we are, we're abandoning our community members in, Mm. in really hard ways. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I want to circle around to how did you come up with the questionnaire, like for the dialogue, Mm. thinking of for birthing people or mamas, for them to kind of how did you come up with that idea and come up with that flow? And yeah, like, where did that come from? So <clears throat> I remember my first year went there that I was like, holy, like this is holy postpartum is, is not something to with. Like, this is not something to be underprepared for. And I remember my whole world as a doula being a flipped upside down with that information that we got there, like that, Mm -hmm. that training experience. And I remember one thing specifically, I had a meeting with a client after that retreat that we went to. 
And I was like, I cannot cover all of this. Mm -hmm. I can't cover all of this. I can't assume people know this and I can't assume that they don't. And so Mm -hmm. I have a background in facilitating and education. And so I, and I worked with college students for 10 years and I'll tell you what, college students are just like expecting parents. None of them listen. (laughs) None of them listen to you. None of them read your emails. Uh None of them read your emails. None of them follow directions. And they just are, they just think that they're going to go into life with everything they have right now. And I'm like, it Mm -hmm. doesn't work like that. So I felt like I, <laughs> I felt like I needed to give my clients a tool that would help them have conversations with each other. Because what I was also finding was mm. that the pregnant person was paying attention and the non-pregnant person was not. So mm. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, the pregnant person needs you to listen and you to show up and you to answer questions and answer the hard questions. Like this is a this is a partnership if they have a mm-hmm. partner. Like mm-hmm. this is a partnership and you are going to be the person that the mental load and everything in the house falls to when that birthing person is in the bed taking care of themselves and the baby and not you anymore. Mm-hmm. And so it felt really important to be able to stimulate that part of their dynamic oh. or like, and be like, you need to have this conversation yourself because you're going to be having lots of hard conversations when your baby comes out and you're tired mm-hmm. and you're going to be having lots of conversations about what to do and you might not have answers. And so why don't we help you get these answers now and prepare as much as we can now so that this doesn't have to be like you with one boob out on the couch crying and your baby's crying and you don't know who to call to help you. Like, mm-hmm. why don't we just save you that step? That's beautiful. Yeah, and- totally. So it, I think it was really born out of frustration. Like I have all of this information and you don't even know how, I don't even know how to give it all to you, but mm-hmm. also like I'm not the answer to your postpartum experience. You are. And like mm-hmm. how seriously take this and for some of the communities that I support they don't know they don't have the language around some of this stuff they don't have the time to be thinking about it because they're surviving yeah and so it I think it affords everyone that I work with the opportunity to focus on what scares them the most focus on what feels the most important to them when they read the things in that document Mm -hmm. and then also for them to continue to understand the enormity of what it means to bring a life into the world. And so, yeah, I made that form and I send it to all of my families and it's the, we spend two hours talking about it. Usually some of my families, we spend less time because they've gone through it and they've really worked at it. Like they, They've talked about things like their answers. I'm like, oh, okay. Yes. And and other people are like, we wanted to go through this with you because we don't know any of this shit. We don't know what we would mm-hmm. do for any of it. So it has been another tool for them to to really feel empowered and for them mm-hmm. to really understand or have some semblance of understanding of the enormity of this process. I'm curious. I, so I see on your website, I just want to point listeners there because I feel like for for people who are about to give birth, I feel like there's Mm -hmm. a lot of really great resources just in thinking about navigating hospitals during the time of COVID. I thought Mm -hmm. you had some really rich resources there. And I see Mm -hmm. also that you're offering mentorships to other doulas. I'm curious like what that could look like or who, like who are you wanting to call in for that experience? Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you asked that question. I think that's a really, it's a really thoughtful question. So starting with the mentorship, I'm looking for people. I'm looking to mentor the people that I'm supposed to. I only will, I'm only taking two to three people at a time. And I envision these relationships being a year long to really help people. The beginnings of doula work are really clunky. They're really awkward. You are very critical of yourself because you're working with people and you don't want to make mistakes. But it's also a really profound time to call in who you want to work with as a doula. So Mm -hmm. really giving people opportunities to have a space to process like any kind of birth that they've gone to just to listen again, not to be a therapist but to, to just listen and 
hold space, but also to help people understand their own community's birth culture. Because I think that like, I live in a place where the birth culture here is very forward moving, there are a lot of resources, and then there are other communities where there are none. And so helping Mm -hmm. people navigate either the desolate spaces that you know, their communities have, or helping them navigate the rich spaces that they're afforded with that privilege. So I prioritize working with Black um, and Indigenous doulas, but we'll work with other people if it's a good fit and if they're ready to, to do the work. But I really want to help people who are in this work to support their communities and those communities being those communities that are marginalized. Yeah. So that's what mentorship looks like to me. And it, it looks like a committed relationship. Like, it's not Mm -hmm. just something where, like, we check in, like, you know, once a month, like, we're talking every week, and I'm challenging you and asking you important questions, and you are challenging me, because I think Mm -hmm. that also, like, mentorship is, it's, it's a reciprocal relationship. I really believe that what you give, you get, and so I want my mentees to push on me, and I want them to, you know, teach me. And so um, it's not, you know, I I think that that's a really, I think it's really important. And I think, Mm. and so that's something that I, I also, I want to support and mentor people who have that spirit about them, because I think we need more people in this world who know that it's okay to push on people who are teaching you. That's really Mm. important to me. So that's such a beautiful reminder. And I feel like it's Mm -hmm. very counter to how I was raised as a, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> totally and it's like more it's just more it just feels like things can evolve if we are questioning each other you know if it's not just a one-way street where like there's a teacher who like gives you the knowledge it's like it's right. a dialogue it's a yeah. you know it's a yeah. bouncing back and forth and so mm-hmm. I love that idea of creating a little bit more play and tension and accountability and yeah evolution in the and depth in the relationship because I think when there isn't questioning there's you're not getting as much depth you have to have the questions to like get into the dirt definitely 100 percent. yeah I love that you're doing that I'm really actually more interested though in creating some more workshops around grief for people. Mm. I am um, looking to create workshops for those who are grieving their mothers because my mother Mm. is no longer living and navigating what that means. Because I think when you lose your mother, no matter how complex your relationship was or how wonderful your relationship was, it is a, it is a mountain that has always been there that is suddenly not there anymore. So like when Mm. you imagine Like maybe there's a tree you see every day when you leave your house or there's Mm -hmm. a mountain in the distance that you see every day. Imagine one day waking up and going outside and it's just gone. We orient ourselves to to those things, right? To those things that are just always there. Mm -hmm. So helping people navigate that grief and community in a, again, not a therapist, but in a way of helping community witness community. I also would love to, I really want to write more. You know, Mm -hmm. I really, I love writing and, oh, thank you. I I really enjoy it and it it gives me, it gives so much to me. Like I I really enjoy sharing my writing, but writing gives me so much. It gives me so much, so much source. Like I feel like Mm -hmm. so resourced when I write. I want to write more and I don't know, I don't know if that means writing for other people or just writing for myself, but I want to write more about what it has meant to witness people in birth and write more about what it has meant to witness people in postpartum and write more about what it has meant to witness people who've experienced loss in pregnancy or who have chosen to terminate pregnancy. So there's a lot there. Like, I think I've had a really magical three and a half, four years of this work that has given me so much to write about yeah I feel like there's like 87 books there like <laughs> right like okay how a partner could have a conversation with another partner and mm-hmm. make it yeah. work better <laughs> you know? right. yeah yeah <laughs> so many different books I feel like I could see writing from this yeah. 
this rich experience of doula doula hood mm-hmm. and witness mm-hmm. holding and and the experience of losing your yeah. mother and mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. yeah you just had so many rich experiences and are reflective of them and you're thoughtfully looking at your experiences yeah yeah it has also been a really beautiful way for me to process what it Mm -hmm. means like the emotional impacts of supporting people in birth and in postpartum because it is that is the thing that I think a lot of you know, a lot of us who go into this work don't realize is that like, we don't just leave these people at the bedside and say like, I'll check on you in a couple days, like we bring them home with us. And we Mm -hmm. bring that energy home with us. And so sometimes that's a way of me saying like, thank you, no longer mine. Like, thank you, you are no longer with me. Thank you. Like I am detaching from you because I really do believe in the power of, of energy. And sometimes I feel like I bring people home with me mm-hmm. so, yeah. yeah do you go home and then you write a little bit or do some journaling to help release because I can no. feel that <laughs> yeah just the cords are like how mm-hmm. do I cut this cord like I need to yeah. just like go yeah. with my- sometimes you know I don't come home and write when I come home from a birth I I go straight to the shower and I especially because of COVID like I my mm-hmm. my partner and I have this routine now where I strip, I take all my clothes off at the door and put them in the washing machine. And like, he keeps the dog away from me because my dog loves to say hi to me as soon as I come in the house. Mm. And I go straight to the shower. And after I did that, I remember in August or no, September, I did that after a 55 hour birth. And I wasn't there for the whole 55. I was like coming and going, um, trying to take care of myself. But it was long for me too. But I remember being like, I have to wash this off of me because Mm. not only did I watch this amazing person push this amazing human out of their body and witness like some really cool portal shit. Like it was a really cool birth in that way, too. Like it was Mm. fucking fucking wild. But I was also like, you know, when when the birthing person looked at me at one point, and said, I think I love you. Oh. As, like, as she's like holding her baby on her chest and oh. she's looking at me and she's like, I've got hard eyes for you. Like you bring oh. that home with you. And sometimes yeah. you, you bring that with you and you bring, it creates this feeling of obligation to people. Mm. And it create it hits this place in us where we feel like I cannot fail you no matter what. And so Mm -hmm. I have to sometimes go into the shower and just like imagine all of those contracts that I've signed, you know, like Mm -hmm. the simple and energetic contracts that I sign with people going down the drain because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like I am but a vessel. I am but my own human in this black ass body who, who was primary function. Unfortunately, every day is about surviving and not being mm-hmm. harmed. And mm-hmm. so my ritual around showering is, is, is that to help me remind me that my energy belongs to me. And no matter how much I love my clients, cause I really fucking love them. And there are some clients that I really fucking love. Like we have, we have been through some shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's really beautiful. But yeah. So a lot of the times when I write all of that to say, I'm sorry that it's mm-hmm. such a long answer. Oh, no, um, it's good. A lot of the times when I write, I'm, it just comes, it, it, mm-hmm. it just like appears it, it, I don't know how to describe it, but it almost feels like something's knocking on my forehead and it's like, Hey, mm-hmm. I need you to write this down and I'll start mm-hmm. writing it. And then it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And then there's a post on Instagram and mm-hmm. that's it. And that, that is also why I, I don't, I'm not one of those people who's like, I have to post every week or every day or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I post, I post when I want to post and I share Mm -hmm. when I want to share, but I am feeling more and more called away from Instagram. I'm feeling more and more Mm -hmm. like I want to honor my writings and Instagram feels like such a temporary space. And it also feels like it feels fake. It doesn't Mm -hmm. feel real. It doesn't feel it. Sometimes I don't feel like Instagram is worthy of what those words hold like and Mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about my writing or trying to like you know inflate myself but more of like I feel like when I write like it feels 
like a really I'm honoring a majestic part of myself and I don't feel like Instagram can hold majesty Mm -hmm. I don't feel like Instagram is a space to hold the sacred I feel like it is you know I totally agree like I I put stuff on there but it's very like I keep it light I don't Mm -hmm. give it like depth really it's just like okay this here's a little surface something but like I never like mine the depths for Instagram like totally I don't know where things belong I I do morning pages so I just like wake up and I just make coffee and I write three pages Mm -hmm. every day it's not good writing but like it just feels Mm -hmm. so good it's just like I have to do it yeah. But yeah, I don't know. If, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Maybe mm-hmm. it could live on your website or have a different website or make a book. I don't yeah. Know. You're not the first person who says you need to make a book. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, I've, I've, there's so many, there's so many things, but I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about it. I don't know. But yeah, that's where my writing comes from. And I am more and more attracted to writing about grief and writing about death and birth and loss, because that just feels so in my space. Like it feels so like where I am and where I want to be. Like I want to linger in that in the space of life and death and in the space of grief and loss, because I think it's what it's what shapes us. Like those, Mm. those are the things that shape us. And I am, I am really enamored with that right now. So, Mm. yeah. That's beautiful. Do you, have you gotten into death doula work at all? Cause I could see some of that kind of coming in there. Yeah. So I, um, I'm actually on the board for an end of life care training organization and we're a community end of life care community group based here in Seattle and it's called a sacred passing and it is like one of my favorite things that I do right now I've taken the the two death doula training courses with them and I and I have I have attended I'm more interested actually in doing death doula work with people who are birthing so loss support um, abortion support and helping people, giving people do birth and death doula support when they know that they're going to um, give birth to a baby who will not live long. And that started in May of 2019 when I supported a family who their baby had a condition called trisomy 13, and he was not expected to live. And we knew that. And so I supported them in their birth. And then they had a friend who was a death doula who supported them on the end of taking care of all of the things that happen after your baby dies and making Mm -hmm. sure that they had time with him. So they had a couple of days where they got to have him in their room. His body was kept cold with ice packs and people got to hold him and I got to hold him. And he lived for, I I don't want to share their whole story, but he lived for 30 minutes after he was born and Mm. he yeah that experience changed me and you know I I had lost my mom two years before that or a year before that and so I'd experienced death very close to me but to experience death where there was new life and like new life was just born and then died (sighs) was like such a reminder that this happens like Mm -hmm. was such a reminder Mm. that Life is not promised to us in any form for mm. any length of time and that we we make a lot of plans, but we don't make plans for how we're going to die and we don't make plans for our death. And very shortly after, like I was I was getting connected to, to a sacred passing and figuring out how to witness and support people in the birth and, and death space because birth and death are the same. Like, yeah. Ooh. They both... Take a take some time. You never know when it's gonna happen. You can't make predictions. Mm-hmm. You can't control it. We can influence birth and death, but we can't control it. Yeah. Well, I, Tavana, I just want to talk to you for like six hundred years. I, I want to respect your time because I think it's been like almost two hours. But I, is there anything else coming through that you want to be sure to share? 
Mm. I think the one thing I would say is like for people who are looking for places to donate their money or donate their time, a sacred passing is an incredible organization. It's a sacred passing.org. And you can also follow them on Instagram at a sacred passing. It's an incredible organization to give, to donate funds to. We work from an anti-racist lens of training end of life caregivers on how to care for anyone and help anyone die well and to understand the different systems people have to navigate in order to die well. So if you'd like to donate money, they're great. I also have a fund and it is the Black Birthing Bodies Fund. You can find it on my website, www.bornrooted.com. And it is a fund that I started to support those in my community who can't afford doula support and who can't afford lactation support. So this fund goes directly to those in my community to give free birth support, free lactation support, to pay for lactation consultant visits for anybody in a Black birthing body who comes to my care. So if that's another place people want to donate, that's another option. But I just really believe strongly in continuing to sow our resources into the future and to continue to sow our resources into people's end of their life as well. So yeah, I think that the only other thing I would say is continue to do the work around what it means to be you continue to deconstruct yourself continue to deconstruct um, your mind and the messages that you've received in your life continue to deconstruct your privilege and then do something about it so Mm. those are the things that i would say oh so beautiful well thank you again (laughs) so much for making time tonight thank you so much sarah (gasps) i hope it's a wonderful night and a good week same for you You too. Bye, Bye, honey. Thanks so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please be sure to connect with Davina Simmons on Instagram at Rooted Birth Doula or check out her beautiful website at bornrooted.com. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Time in the Studio Podcast or on my website, timeinthestudio.com. And a huge thank you to Karina Rep for the intro music, Release Me, and the outro music, Need You, Don't Need You. You can find Karina Rep on Instagram at Karina Rep. Have a great week, and may our efforts benefit all beings. Take care, and till next time. <laughs>